Western calendar traditionally dates from the birth of Christ. 2,000 years later, we might be forgiven for thinking it dates from the birth of Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. That's BC, before the code, and AD, after Dan. It's a measure of how this innocent-looking thriller has shaken up the establishment. More people are reading The Da Vinci Code than the scriptures at the moment and the gospels. And therefore many people are being introduced to the church and to Christianity through the Da Vinci Codes. And the word according to Dan Brown is that Christ was not only a mere mortal, but husband to Mary Magdalene and a father. It is quite simply more plausible that a man should lay claim to a throne, be married and have children, than that he should be born of a virgin, walk on water and rise from the dead. Although marketed as a novel, the Da Vinci Code's carefully created air of authenticity has made us question why we take the authorised version of history on trust. What we have been told on the whole by uh, Christians and so on and church people and others uh, is true, is actually very dubiously sourced. And with 43 million sales worldwide, Dan Brown's secular Jesus and Mary seem to have attracted a devoted following. Things like the Da Vinci Code uh, will uh, not just attract readers, that's OK. What is rather disconcerting is attract believers. But are we just being cynically manipulated? It's not as if this is the spirit of God moving on the waters. This is capitalism. Or has Dan Brown cracked the most difficult code of all? How to find meaning in the materialistic 21st century? It makes it possible for people to believe again, even if it's only to believe in conspiracy. In case you've been cloistered in a monastery since 2003, The Da Vinci Code is the fourth and most successful novel by American author Dan Brown. It is officially the world's fastest selling book. Its story is that for 2,000 years the church has fed us a myth about Jesus' death and resurrection, while suppressing the truth that he founded a bloodline that exists to this day. The secret is being kept alive by a shadowy organization called the Priory of Zion. The life of the book has been every bit as extraordinary as its content. It's been made into a Hollywood film. Lovely town. Nice people. It's provoked protest. About the Da Vinci Code. Sister Mary Michael is holding a protest against the film, which she considers to be a heresy. And fierce debate. The crowds have come along for a lecture series on the Da Vinci Code and its claims. The popular interest is enormous and uh, there are some serious questions about history and about religion. It's been dissected in court following claims of plagiarism. The historians who wrote the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail say the whole architecture of their book has been stolen by Dan Brown. But Random House will argue that ideas have been recycled for centuries and it's leading Britain's tourist recovery following the London bombings. OK, this is Temple Church. We're rather tucked away off Fleet Street, and so a great many people never even knew we existed until the Da Vinci Code came out. Some of the life of the Da Vinci Code, which I think we haven't taken enough into account, is less the actual reading of the book and more the afterlife it has on, well, what if? What, what do you think of the idea that? Haven't you always wondered about it? He's actually got some pretty plausible theories on Mary Magdalene and that stuff, but I would have to do a lot of research of my own before I ever figured it out. Uh, I think it's always a good thing to re-examine um, perhaps things that we've taken for granted. Yes, so uh, it's uh, beneficial. Reading it now, I think, well, is this all really true? <laughs> is it just a good story, a good yarn? Which I, I think it is. It is. Readers are intrigued, even sympathetic to the plot, because it builds on ideas such as the Holy Grail, which hover in the popular imagination between legend and history. Many of the ideas advanced in it had been talked about before for many centuries. Long before Brown wrote his book, 
The BBC had explored similar territory in a documentary series called Chronicle, made in the 1970s. The programmes investigated the sudden secret wealth of a French priest in the town of Rennes-le-Chateau and his connections to the Priory of Zion. The priest who began in poverty and yet spent millions who made a discovery in his church of the parchments which hid secret messages. One speaking of a treasure belonging to Dagobert and to Zion. The thing about the Chronicle series was that they weren't some kind of new age, hippy-dippy documentary. They were a proper sourced historical documentary series. The impact on the viewing public was enormous. Uh, they were at the time regarded as the most successful documentaries the BBC had ever done. The presenter and programme consultant was Henry Lincoln. He looked very credible as a presenter. He has this sort of rather magisterial way of presenting himself, telling you these amazing things that he discovered with the, these, these incredible documents. Among the information it contains is a list of the names of the Priory of Zion's Grand Masters after their separation from the Templars and up to the present day. Victor Hugo, Jean Cocteau, Leonardo da Vinci, Isaac Newton. Some of these names are so illustrious that the list seemed just the sort of grandiose pedigree that would be created for itself by a lunatic fringe body of eccentrics playing at secret societies. Um, you were inclined to say this has got the BBC's imprimatur upon it. It therefore must be pretty true. However, Henry Lincoln was more familiar with the world of fiction than fact. You know, he wasn't uh, a qualified historian. He hadn't taught. He hadn't actually done any major historical works. In fact, he was probably, in fact, at that stage, best known as a scriptwriter for Doctor Who. And the story of the Priory of Zion read rather like a script. The Priory of Zion. Does it still exist? Is it really still alive? Still a force to be reckoned with? Novelist Richard Lee collaborated with Lincoln on the Third Chronicle programme. Henry was swamped with a uh, record quantity of uh, fan mail. The number of letters received dwarfed anything the Beep had done previously. Uh, requests for more information, requests for additional films, requests for a book. In 1982, Lincoln, Lee and a colleague, Michael Bajant, expanded their research in the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail. When the book appeared, it, um, within a day, shot to the top of the bestseller list. For the next three weeks, it sold on a scale comparable to that of uh, the Da Vinci Code. In the book, they speculated that the Priory of Zion was formed to protect the Holy Grail and its secret, that Christ's bloodline descended through the Merovingian kings of France. The theologians, naturally, were up in arms. If we can take the message and, and turn now to, to the bishop, what does that, the message of the book, what is that going to mean to Christianity? If people accepted it as true, would there be any point in continuing with, with well, Christianity? Well, they're not going to accept it as true, and I really think that's a hypothetical question which is useless. Let's consider whether it is true or not, because no one's going to accept a thesis which is so uh, academically absurd. And the professional historians were up in arms because we had trespassed on their territory. And we had committed the cardinal sin of um, making connections between diverse spheres. Regular triangles. What possible connection could there be between geometry and the priest who found treasure in a sleepy Pyrenean village? Uh, what Holy Blood, Holy Grail did was to dismiss reputable evidence which didn't uh, go with its theories. Uh, accept disreputable evidence and fill in the gaps where there was no evidence at all. Then I remembered that Rennes le Chateau is only one of three castles vital to this story. One of the things that the authors of the Holy Blood, the Holy Grail claimed was that there was a kind of old, dry and inadequate scholarly way of doing history, uh, which was essentially analytical. 
and that this wouldn't suit their purposes. There's a passage in the book where they say this. And then what they had to come up with was a new, essentially kind of synthetic way of looking at history, which effectively meant it allowed them to join up any two utterly disparate points if they could find any point of connection between them at all. And if they could find any point of connection between them at all, to say that they were connected. Coincidence? The accuracy is astonishing. One must bear in mind that uh, in certain areas, any research inevitably is going to be historical conjecture. Most biblical scholarship involves conjecture. In 1996, the BBC made another investigation into the Priory of Zion in a Time Watch documentary. This time, it concluded it was a modern hoax by a Frenchman, Pierre Plantard, who was claiming descent from the Merovingian kings. Under French law, every new club or association must register itself with the authorities. And that's why there's a dossier here showing that a priory of Zion filed the proper forms in 1956. You know, I'm older than the priory of Zion. According to a founding member, this eccentric association took its name not from Jerusalem, but from a nearby mountain. The dossier also notes that the priory's self-styled Grand Master, Pierre Plantard, who is central to this story, has done time in jail. One of the things I think that which is interesting about this is the way in which the authors of the Holy Blood and Holy Grail have never, as far as I know, turned round to the rest of the world and said it was a load of rubbish. Terribly sorry and all that. We're not going to give the money back because we spent it all and, you know, we did do quite a lot of work and we were hoaxed too. But actually, it's all complete and utter tosh. The authors, however, still maintain there was a priory of Zion in medieval times. We do not know whether the 1956 Priore was a latter-day concoction, whether it was a continuation of the medieval Priore, whether Planta and um, the other members of the 1956 order simply hijacked the name of the medieval organization and appended their own operation to it. But they never claimed the book was pure history. We never said this is what we believe. We never said this is what happened. We didn't even say this is probably what happened. All we attempted to do was ask, are the various points of this hypothesis plausible? Is it plausible that Jesus might have had a claim to the throne? Is it plausible that he might have been married, that there might have been children, that those children eventually might have uh, intermarried to produce the Merovingian bloodline? And we concluded, yes, it was plausible. And that was all we concluded. So the irony of the recent plagiarism court case is that there's little historical basis for either book. I think it's bizarre, this court case of Beijing and Lee uh, versus Dan Brown, because it just shows that the whole thing is made up. You know, the, 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 the uh, one side says, no, we made it up, and the other side says, no, I made it up. So if anybody was in any doubt that this was complete fiction, they just need to look at the, the, the proceedings of the court case. Lee and Bajant say all they wanted was a fuller acknowledgement of their work, not just the passing reference the Da Vinci Code gives them. Here's perhaps the best-known tome, Teabing said, pulling a tattered hardcover from the stack and handing it to her. The cover read, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, the acclaimed international bestseller. Sophie glanced up. An international bestseller? I've never heard of it. And the reference to the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail is one that damns us with faint praise, nor does it even mention the authors. For all the uninitiated reader knows the book could be fictitious. However, Dan Brown does hint at the author's existence through his mischievously named character, Lee Teabing. Lee Teabing. It's the name of a character from the Da Vinci Code. And look, Teabing is an anagram of Bajant. And look what Dan Brown has done here. He's taken all the letters from Richard Lee's surname and replaced them with identical replicas. And what sort of character is Lee Teabing? Well, he's an English expert on books about the Holy Grail. I don't think um, the patronising, slightly comic, slightly sinister figure of Lee Teabing 
constitutes an acknowledgement. Despite being able to take advantage of fictional devices, Brown's book offers itself as factually based. When you read Holy Blood and Holy Grail, which um, purports to be a work of fact, it actually feels as though you're reading a work of fiction. Um, it seems to be full of um, wild and fantastic leaps of the imagination from one fact, supposed fact to another. Now, and then you have the Da Vinci Code, which purports to be fiction, but when you read it, it feels as though you're reading um, a book, a novel, full of factual accuracies. It even starts with the word fact. The fascinating way the book itself seems to be constructed is that the, the beginning of it sort of tells you these are the facts. Now, that's the first step into the fiction of the book. It's quite a clever, engaging device. So for any novelist to state that categorically, this is fact, means he expects uh, the reader to uh, accept it as such, and most readers will. Dan Brown has come so close to something that is deep and important and true, and then at the very last moment he sort of shoots off into orbit and really into fantasy. I, I believed a lot more perhaps than I should have done about it uh, and thought that uh, there was a great deal of fact in it. Um, it made me pretty amazed about it all because I can't believe that you know it really existed. It's pretty amazing that it's all real, I guess. In the case of The Da Vinci Code, actually the, the assertion in the front is quite cleverly written because he does not assert that the book is factually true. He asserts that uh, Opus Dei exists, that it's controversial, that the Priory of Zion exists, but he doesn't say it's an incompletely new invention and is absolute nonsense anyway. Um, and he asserts that his description of places are uh, correct. Though how he came to put Versailles north of Paris, I shall never know. But what he never ever said, actually, was that the book was factually correct. But people sort of just read that preface quickly, I think, and then assumed that that is what he'd said. Commentators are divided over whether it matters that readers are taken in. I mean, the Da Vinci Code is a strange hybrid animal, because although it is partly about history, it's set in the present. Um, so some of the rules that you apply to historical fiction you don't necessarily need to immediately apply to it. So I suppose the only argument about something like the Da Vinci Code is how therefore honest you are about all of the source material that you based it on. So people can always say, look it was here, I drew on it, but I made more of it than it is, because this is a work of fiction and those were works of pseudo-fact or theory. If Dan Brown puts that preface at the front of his book, he's following in a long and, frankly, noble literary tradition. Daniel Defoe in Robinson Crusoe, supposedly the first English novel, had a preface which said, everything in this book is true. It was a, a device to make his readers interested. Now, in fact, Defoe did base it on a true story, but he made much more of Robinson Crusoe up, much the same as, as Dan Brown. If you believed it, if you took any action based on the notion that you believed it, um, if it affected any of your other kind of relationships to the truth, then you have been sold a pup. So why did Dan Brown write that preface? If Dan Brown hadn't put that preface in the beginning of the Da Vinci Code, the Da Vinci Code would not have been the success it was. But of course, Brown is also an accomplished handler of the thriller format. It was a good read. It's, um, um, it kept me, uh, kept me gripped, actually. I found, it, I found it quite difficult to put down. I'll get to a point where they bash the, one of the significant people over the head and uh, I want to see what happens next. I had a lot of admiration for the skill in holding an audience. Um, I had a lot of admiration for the fact that at the end of each chapter, you have to read on to the next page. It's kind of clunky, the way it's put together. So you can almost see the mechanism of how it's happening. You can see that he ends every chapter with a question that has to be resolved in the next chapter. Now, as a thriller writer, I knew there was a danger in that, which is if you 
do it one too many times, people start to get bored. They start to kind of see that it's a device. But the clever thing about the Da Vinci Code, of course, is that exactly when you're starting to see the device, you're actually having fed into you a quite interesting bit of almost secret pseudo-history. So you're slightly more in intellectually interested as well as being kind of manipulated. And Brown's narrative draws on many sources. It is a plot trawling of every esoteric pot boiler for the last 30 years. It has got um, ingredients, components that um, will appeal to most people on a subliminal or semi-conscious or subconscious level. Lost kings, buried treasures, secret societies, conspiracies. All of this is potent, heady stuff. You put them all together, four or five of the most potent myths in European history into a one interwoven saga, and you've got a winner on your hands. It's a very clever, but actually rather old-fashioned thriller. Hitchcock used to define the thriller as being something that needed a MacGuffin. I, it didn't really matter what it was, but there was a reason for the plot to start rolling, which then threw conflict and obstacles in the way. And you could argue that the search for the Holy Grail is about the biggest MacGuffin you could possibly have if you were writing a thriller. The legend of the Holy Grail was itself a literary invention. It was invented in the late 12th century by Chrétien de Troyes although it wasn't at all clear what it was. But it, it, it very soon came to be associated either with the cup Christ had used at the Last Supper or the dish in which there had been the, the meat at the Last Supper. And further, that uh, Joseph of Arimathea had used this vessel to collect Christ's uh, blood uh, uh, from at the time of the crucifixion. Uh, that very, very quickly uh, came to be believed. Um, and all sorts, rather like now, all sorts of, of, of bodies started exploiting this. The most famous, from our point of view, is the Abbey of Glastonbury, uh, which was busy building its reputation on the Arthurian myth. Glastonbury Abbey fixed the grail in the public imagination. What it was fixed at was Something which was out there, to be searched for, could be found if only you were heroic and pure enough, but was unbelievably difficult to find. The Grail myth then went underground until the 19th century, and the man who above all restored it, it was, it was uh, Wagner in Lohengrin and Parsifal. <laughs> In modern times, the Grail has become something less tangible, as Dan Brown recognises. And for most, I suspect, the Holy Grail is simply a grand idea, a glorious, unattainable treasure that somehow, even in today's world of chaos, inspires us. The book's main characters hunt the Grail, but they are also seeking personal answers. In New Ageism, it is very often that the Grail ceases to be actually a physical cup and becomes something else. And this is where this spills over into Dan Brown. One's search for the Holy Grail is a, a, a search for, for self-realisation, self-understanding. In the Da Vinci Code, the secret of the Grail is preserved in cryptic form in some of the world's most famous old master paintings. Pictures are a great choice because without labels, without clear labels, you can, you can make anything of them. You can bring any potential interpretation and encourage your viewers to see them in, in a wide range of different ways. The idea of great secrets hidden in paintings had been championed by Henry Lincoln in the Chronicle series. He saw possible clues in a painting by Nicholas Poussin, which featured a grave close to Rennes le Chateau. Lincoln wondered if Poussin was the artist and if the shepherdess was an allusion to Poussin's best-known painting, The Shepherds of Arcadia. 
The obvious relevance of the painting led me to undertake a detailed examination of it, and I found what seemed to me to be a curious and rigid geometry. I sought the guidance of Professor Christopher Cornford of the Royal College of Art, who has made a special study of the geometry of paintings. As I worked on the painting, it did seem to me to become evident that there was present in the geometry of it, somewhere in this area, the presence of what could be a regular pentagon and the angles of the pentagon. The next step was to join the opposite points of the pentagon. This makes a five-pointed star. What could this imply? In fact, what is the significance of the pentacle? An ancient symbol of the occult, the pentacle seemed to indicate something of magical significance. But the Da Vinci Code, as its title suggests, targeted a higher profile artist. If you say, name an artist to a total stranger, he's more likely to say Leonardo da Vinci than any, anything. Besides, the Da Vinci Code sounds rather better than the Rembrandt Code or the Raphael Code, doesn't it? Da Vinci. Da Vinci, well, A, it scans rather well, um, and B, that name brings that kind of resonance. So we feel clever because we're not simply buying an airport thriller, we're, we're buying into a whole package of cultural references. Leonardo is a figure who orchestrated his mystique even during his own lifetime. We have these coded notebooks in mirror writing. We have his drawings. So he remains a fascinating figure whom we, each generation tries to put back together for themselves. Oh, Leonardo has, is surrounded by myths that encourage people to write silly things. Leonardo is always said to be the inventor of the tank, the inventor of the aeroplane, the man who understood about aerial perspective. Well, yes, he did, but he wasn't the first to do so by any means. And Leonardo, in his own lifetime, was very keen to promote himself, promote himself as, as a genius who was far superior to his fellow Florentines. She may be the face I can't forget. In The Da Vinci Code, Leonardo's Mona Lisa is portrayed as androgynous, in celebration of one of the book's themes, harmony between the sexes. Dan Brown takes a fairly conventional, almost cartoon-like reading of the Mona Lisa, i.e. this good combination of masculinity and femininity, and, and then throws in some quite wacky ideas about um, e Egyptian references as well. This is only one of many ways in which that poor picture has been abused over the centuries. In fact, far from being an enigmatic portrait, the Mona Lisa is one of the most well-researched paintings in the world. We know who the sitter is, Lisa del Gioconda. We know she's a doctor's wife. We know that the picture was in Leonardo's possession until he died. And we know that it came back into Milan um, amongst the possessions of one of his favored apprentices there. So, so we can, it's bizarrely, it's one of the pictures that doesn't contain much mystery, much clues to secret hidden meanings, but we won't let it go. Brown liked the idea of cipher so much that he gave his two main characters complementary code-breaking skills. Robert Langdon is an American symbols expert, and Sophie Neveu is a French cryptographer who supposedly trained at Royal Holloway College in England. I used to jokingly introduce myself as the man who supervised Sophie Neveu, but then was alarmed that roughly one in five, one in six people actually asked me what she was like. So. <laughs> It, the books have taken over and people lost reality and fiction and so on, so I don't do that anymore. Codes are a perfect match for the thriller genre because they create mystery by concealing real meanings. Okay, well, I suspect that Dan Brown latched onto coding theory because he recognised it as a sexy topic with popular appeal. I have to break the code. Break the code. I'm sorry, I'm very thick. <laughs> I told you though when my, my skills on code breaking were absolutely nil. No idea. <laughs> and 
people like it and they like puzzle solving and they like the air of mystery. And the concept of things being encrypted adds mystery. Okay, it's a row of flowers. One, two, three. This is one of the cleverest things about the Da Vinci Code is the puzzles, the use of puzzles and the use of codes. What's happening to the characters happens to you as the reader. You identify with them as a result, even though they bear no resemblance to any human being I've ever come across. Uh, that's what sucks you in. And, and it rewards you as well. It makes you feel clever if you get it before them, which frankly, a lot of the codes aren't particularly earth shattering, so you might well do. Eight roses. It's a line of eight roses and I have absolutely no idea what's in it. Prior to 1960, coding theory was a black art that was mainly confined to governments and spies and military and so on. It's in the Second World War when, not surprisingly, armies need to communicate and they don't want the enemy to know what they're doing, so they use secret codes and things like the Enigma and the activities at Bletchley Park are now right in the public domain because the 30-year rule's out. And there's no doubt that they've had a lot to do with the popularization of cryptography. With the advent of the internet, computers, telecommunications, it's now part of everyday business practice and it's just become a popular science. Holy grail. Oh, holy. <laughs> 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 yes, that's good, yeah. Part of the appeal of the Da Vinci Code is that it offers neat solutions in a messy world. You can go to Waterstones, take the Da Vinci Code off the shelf and escape into that. And there it comes alive for us, because it's well written, it's a good book, it comes alive, and there we are in the conspiracy, and there we are getting the answers. It's all resolved and we come away satisfied and the world seems to be a better place. The book also picks up on the contemporary rise of conspiracy theory, as we've become more suspicious of authority figures and institutions. One of the kind of strong selling points of something like the Da Vinci Code is the idea that there is an official version of history which the authorities give us, you know, whether they be the church authorities or the government or shadowy others, uh, and then a true version of history, a true version of history which we can be let into. Events like the death of Diana and the 9-11 attacks have increased our feelings of suspicion. That situation became increasingly acute after the millennium and even more after the events of 11 September, when everything seemed increasingly uncertain, when people desperately wanted answers to account for what seemed to be a general collapse of everything uh, that had previously been taken for granted as stable and secure. I think the spread of different kinds of media and the lack of trust in different kinds of media, um, you know, whether you talk about political spin or newspaper bias or internet blogging or whatever are the other reasons, is, people are starting to read in a different way. They're starting to think, what are the sources of this? And I think that, the paranoia that lies behind that, the fear that in fact you might not be being told the truth, is something that underpins the fascination of the Da Vinci Code. We are readier to believe the strange, the unnatural, the ghost story, than we are rational explanations, or simply ordinary alternatives. Our susceptibility prompted the Archbishop of Canterbury to make conspiracy the subject of his Easter message. We are instantly fascinated by the suggestion of conspiracies and cover-ups. This has become so much the stuff of our imagination these days that it's only natural, it seems, to expect it when we turn to ancient texts, especially biblical texts. They will believe that there is this big force out there, whether it's the Catholic Church or Opus Dei or the Pope himself, you know, deliberately keeping everybody in ignorance, you know, so that we, none of us, um, will ever know that um, Jesus' bloodline is out there and these children are out there and... You know, if they're out there, why, why, don't, why, why aren't they out there doing miracles? Why aren't they out there saving the world? As a major institution, the church is fertile territory for conspiracy theories, and the Catholic Church especially so. I think it taps into, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world, um, the very um, ancient anti-Catholic prejudice that really... Um, uh, exists very strongly in 
parts of the Protestant imagination. Um, you won't see much negative in the book about the Protestant church. The previously little known Catholic organization Opus Dei found itself demonized in the Da Vinci Code as the powerful force trying to wipe out the Priory of Zion. Brown presents the following description in his preface. And it says, fact, the Vatican prelates are known as Opus Dei, a deeply devout Catholic sect that has been the topic of recent controversy due to reports of brainwashing, coercion, and a dangerous practice known as corporal mortification. Opus Dei refutes that description. The main character about, uh, of Opus Dei in the Da Vinci Code is a brainwashed killer monk. You know, it's a bit, it's not very nice to be depicted as a brain killer monk, brainwashed killer monk. But actually, we don't have any monks. We love monks in Opus Dei because we are Catholics. Uh, but, uh, and there are many types of monks in the Catholic Church, but Opus Dei isn't one of the organizations containing monks. I mean, I know Opus Dei. I'm not myself a member of Opus Dei, but I know Opus Dei. Um, uh, they are decent, uh, well-meaning, rather rigid, rather too rigid for my taste, <laughs> Catholics. The Opus Dei movement began in Spain. Madrid, 1928. In that year, a young priest in a working-class district founded an organization intended to help ordinary Catholics dedicate their daily lives to God. The name of the priest was Jose Maria Escriva de Balaguer, and the organization was Opus Dei, God's Work. During the turbulence of the Spanish Civil War, Opus Dei offered stability and structure. In Spain under Franco, Opus Dei became rather like Freemasonry without the secrecy. It was an energetic, diligent, fundamentally apolitical philosophy. Socialists as well as Franco supporters were Opus Dei members, and it appealed especially to the professional classes. Opus Dei expanded rapidly. In the 1960s, seven members of the Spanish government were Opus Dei men. If you wanted to get on in business, you joined the Opus Dei. And for that reason, the Opus Dei got a name in Spain, which I don't think it deserves elsewhere. When Opus Dei reached Britain, it now has 500 members, it made headlines for encouraging its members to practice corporal mortification. Brown's killer monk revels masochistically in the wearing of a spiked metal band on his leg called a cilis. I think the uh, thing to think about corporal mortification uh, is, like everything else in the Da Vinci Code, is grossly distorted and is not put in context. I mean, the context is that to be a Christian, Christ said you have to pray, fast, and do good works. These are the three things that Christians do. And within fasting and self-denial, there's a long tradition. So corporal mortification has to be understood in the context of all sacrifices, uh, where most of life's sacrifices are small. Sometimes they're bodily things, like uh, wearing a cilice at the top of your leg, uh, which causes discomfort, but doesn't draw any blood or harm you in any way. And you offer that discomfort to God in the same way as you offer the fasting, not eating, or sleeping rough, or walking barefoot. And this is very far removed from the type of masochistic, gruesome representation that you find in Da Vinci Code. Brown's biggest conspiracy theory of all is that Jesus intended women to have a powerful place in his ministry. According to these unaltered Gospels, it was not Peter to whom Christ gave directions with which to establish the Christian church. It was Mary Magdalene. Sophie looked at him. You're saying the Christian church was to be carried on by a woman? That was the plan. Jesus was the original feminist. One theme of the book, which particularly appeals to female readers, is the idea of a woman at the centre of Christianity. Perhaps this is no surprise, given that the court case revealed that Dan Brown's wife, Blythe, did much of his research. He really extols um, the feminine in early Christianity and also is, is really blames, appears to blame the Catholic Church for kind of writing female sexuality out of its doctrine. 
Now, it, admittedly, um, whatever the rights and wrongs of um, the Da Vinci Code in doing this, um, the Catholic Church has made it very difficult for women throughout the ages by um, elevating as its most prominent woman, the Virgin Mary, you know, a virgin who has a child. How much more impossible can life get? There's an argument as to whether or not there should be women priests. So the idea that actually Mary Magdalene was Christ's lover and sires a generation which then continues to this day is a perfect way of kind of feminizing Christianity at exactly the moment when a great many women and some men are saying that that's exactly what needs to be done to it. So even if it's not true, the speculation fits into endless discussions that we're already having. It's very much trying to celebrate and bring back the feminine divine, which is really important to me because I'm actually Wiccan. So I actually believe in that, and that, you know, that was really important because it's mentioned a lot in the book of the goddess and everything. So um, that was, you know, that was really good to read. Brown attempted to prove the importance of Mary Magdalene by claiming that Leonardo painted her into the Last Supper on Christ's right hand. Sophie could not take her eyes from the woman beside Christ. The Last Supper is supposed to be 13 men. Who is this woman? Although Sophie had seen this classic image many times, she had not noticed this glaring discrepancy. Everyone misses it, Teeping said. Our preconceived notions of this scene are so powerful that our minds blank out the incongruity and overrides our eyes. It's known as Scotoma, Langdon added. The brain does it sometimes with powerful symbols. Brown's claims have even made art historians do a double take. I have been back to look at the Last Supper with a fiercely analytical eye. This is what he thinks, can I see it? Not this is what he thinks, I don't want to see it, but can I see it? Can I see in that picture what he sees? And spending a day, a whole day, virtually on my own, in contemplation of that picture, I see absolutely no foundation to any of his ideas about it. To try to argue that one figure is female, other figures are male, it doesn't work because if you actually look at the faces, they're quite similar. And the so-called Mary Magdalene and the features of Christ are indeed almost identical there. Long hair, long flowing hair in this period does not indicate femaleness there. There's a real confusion over what the 16th century, the late 15th, early 16th century, understood to be female dress, what they understood to be male dress there. And, and this book just hasn't, hasn't got it there. Dan Brown has quite cynically pressed the feminist button. Wonderful. Here you have a picture in the Last Supper of 13 men. And one of them is suddenly turned into a woman. Not only a woman, but a woman with a past. And that, a prostitute redeemed by the company of Christ himself. Oh, no. All those who think that we should have women priests and women bishops and even a woman archbishop sooner rather than later will rejoice in the presence of the Magdalene at the Last Supper. The novel could have been written for all those silly women. Even if there was a secret message in The Last Supper, it would have been fortunate to have survived. Fresco paintings were an extremely fragile medium where speed was of the essence. Leonardo, halfway through the painting, would go and spend a whole day just looking at it, gazing at his own work, and then put one tiny touch of paint on and go away. You're talking about a fresco. The whole business of painting a fresco means that you paint on damp plaster. You do not come back three weeks later, contemplate, and put a dry touch of paint on dry plaster and go away. It falls off. The fresco disintegrated rapidly and was greatly altered by heavy-handed repairs over the centuries. A recent restoration reveals how little of Leonardo's original work remains. What we have of the Last Supper today is, is a ghost of its former self there. We're, we're seeing very much the, the under, under, 
underpaint of what was a very complex and highly built up picture. Brown based his thesis about Mary Magdalene on a series of Gospels discovered in 1945 in Egypt, which are known as the Gnostic Gospels. They were written several hundred years after the New Testament and create a very different image of Mary Magdalene. They paint a picture of Mary as a significant woman in the early church in conflict with Peter and the disciples, one whom Jesus loved and therefore spent time with and gave knowledge to. But there are some teasing omissions to the texts which were damaged by ants. And he kissed her, that we have at the beginning of this line, on her, and then there's a lacuna. And of course, this lacuna, this missing text, has been the object of quite a bit of speculation by scholars. Where exactly did he kiss her? Uh, most likely on the mouth, and that can be restored here on the basis of Coptic grammar and the length of the lacuna with a great deal of confidence. Now, in the Gnostic Gospel of Philip, um, there's a very interesting passage where Jesus and Mary Magdalene have a very passionate snog, basically. And um, the disciples um, get very upset about this, the watching disciples, and say, um, Jesus, Master, um, why do you love her more than you love us? And Jesus says back to them, no, no, you're getting the question the wrong way round. What you must ask yourselves is, why do I not love you as much as I love her? This tale would seem to undermine Christ's feminist credentials. All the Gospels, even the Gnostic ones, he never has um, a female disciple um, among the Twelve. And, um, you know, Mary, even at the most liberal um, expression you can take of the Gnostic Gospels is, is a sex object to him, basically. So um, it's not ideal, even in that, even the Gnostic Christianity, the way that women are represented. Today, the Gnostics are viewed as the New Age believers of their day seeking a direct communion with a higher power. This coloured their writings about events that happened centuries before. One of the things that's very attractive about um, Gnostic beliefs is that they do um, seem to offer knowledge, especially knowledge about the transcendent, about the supernatural, and they offer pathways to knowledge and through doorways, through mysteries. You know, at one point in the Da Vinci Code, Sophie Nouveau is, is carrying this key around, this key that's the answer to the mystery. And that's what the Gnostic religions offer. They, they were the key to the mysteries of life. The fact that the Gnostic Gospels were left out of the New Testament has fed the idea that the official church tried to bury Mary Magdalene's importance. The church didn't need to suppress them. They fell into disuse of their own accord. You know, the, the real Gospels were very much used and the others just fell into disuse. They were not important. The people didn't take them seriously. No one I, reputable would, would, would treat the Gospel of St Mary Magdalene in the same light as the uh, Mark, Matthew, Luke and John. Although the Mary Magdalene story is a conspiracy theory, the modern church, both Catholic and Protestant, has been alarmed at the public reception of Brown's story. The um, heresy that he has revived in this book is one that goes back to the earliest days of the church and is one that the church um, spent a lot of money, a lot of time and a lot of lives um, suppressing. And the church is alarmed because it knows that this heresy um, was very, very powerful and very potent um, early on and was capable of attracting people to it. And so again, you know, it naturally um, has frightened them to see it taking hold of the public imagination in quite such a powerful way once again. The book at one level is nonsense, um, is historically inaccurate, but at another level, of course, it, it touches nerves with the church and half-truths are there. When it first came out and it became clear that um, millions of people were reading this book, um, the Catholic Church responded very in a fearful way and in an aggressive way, in a defensive way, um, dismissing it as fantasy, as rubbish, as nonsense. There are good reasons why readers of the Da Vinci Code are prepared to question the traditional doctrine of the church. The best thing that you can say about this discussion is that it reminds people that there are practically no sources for what exists in the New Testament. There's practically nothing to suggest that any one account is better than any other account. And that has allowed people to come in and say, my version of this that I now give you is 
actually as good and as well sourced as the one which everybody is led to accept. I think you could probably argue that the history of the church as it moves from early reality into institutionalised power was always one there where there was a lot of slippage between what the doctrine became and what the reality became. The Da Vinci Code also taps into the spiritual uncertainty and distrust of the 21st century. Like you've lost all hope and your sanity. My own theory, for what it's worth, is that over the last two centuries, in Western culture at any rate, um, religion and secularism have fought each other to a standstill. And people believe in science as little as they believe in religion. And we are left with uh, 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 neither side having won in a kind of vacuum. We have a duty. We really have a duty. People like myself who do genuinely and heartfeltly believe what the Gospels and the Church tell us, we have a charge to recognise that the story we are telling is to our generation, frankly, balmy. Let's be honest. And then we might at least have a real dialogue with those who wonder, why do we tell this story? The perceived threat of Dan Brown's version of the Christ story has united many branches of the church in a counter-offensive. With great aplomb, they're riding the tale of Da Vinci Code tourism to get people through their doors. Lincoln Cathedral has seen visitor numbers rise since it played host to the feature film. For, it should be mentioned, a six-figure sum. It would have been easy to just say no and that was a real option because if the film comes out, it paints Christianity in this light, people go to the film, they don't believe as a result of that, then that would harm our mission and the mission of the church. So it was a difficult decision and many others thought that we should not have proceeded, but we did on the basis that we felt that this was something we had to engage with. But to have had quite such a response, such an active response on the web, on television, on the radio, in books, this is all to the good, and I, I have to admit that I've joined the fray. Uh, not only do I give my weekly talk on Fridays, I've actually written a short book about it. Even Opus Dei is taking a positive attitude to the negative publicity. With the Da Vinci Code, uh, we've had a huge amount of interest. You know, for example, our website had uh, 100,000 hits in 2003 and a million in 2005, so this uh, tenfold increase. So for all its fears, it appears as if the Da Vinci Code might benefit the church in the long run. Even though it's a work of fiction, in 40 or 50 years' time, people will still be talking about it. It's a seminal book. They will look back and see this as a life-changing era for the world and for the church, really. I don't think that's putting it too strongly. Visitor numbers have also increased to the galleries of London and Paris. Does it matter that a thriller is responsible for this renaissance in art appreciation? If you go to the Louvre to see the Mona Lisa, are all those people who are standing in front of you looking at this picture produced in Florence in the early 16th century? Are they trying to kind of really understand the picture? Or are they saying, oh, ticked off that clue. Let me rush off up to Milan now and tick off that clue. The only thing that makes Dan Brown's book important in the field of Leonardo's studies is the rip-roaring success that it has been. Nobody who's ever written a serious book on Leonardo has had anything like the success. And Dan Brown's hypotheses have disrupted the general understanding of the picture. Therefore, it does matter. For the last three years, Da Vinci Code mania has dominated our culture in extraordinary ways. And the fact that a mere novel can wreak such havoc with our sense of reality perhaps reveals a great deal about our state of mind at the turn of the millennium. What the Da Vinci Code is doing is it is... It is... Um, I hate to use the word exploit because I'm not sure that is the correct word for what the author uh, considered he was doing, but the effect is it exploits illusions. It, it, it 
presents these illusions which so many people believe in and creates a story out of them. Um, I, 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 and I don't blame him. For, I don't blame the author for doing this. Um, he, he's made an awful lot of money out of it, of course, but, well, that, that is his right. But nevertheless, what he is doing is exploiting those illusions. That is all he is doing. And I just feel very, very sorry for the people who believe what they read in the Da Vinci Code. It will be very difficult for, I imagine, millions of readers now who have no other access to the realities of the story of Leonardo to believe anything other than the Da Vinci Code. It is such a distortion. That is why I deplore it. A novel is right. In fact, what I think I'm deploring is the success of the novel rather than the novel itself. And for that, of course, one can't blame Dan Brown. So can we blame his publishers, Random House? It's very interesting that when people say the book has sold this many million hardbacks in America, well, one of the reasons it's done that is because you can't buy it in paperback in America. So some of this is marketing, very creative, successful, powerful marketing. But it's not as if this is the spirit of God moving on the waters. This is capitalism. In fact, the American paperback has just come out, coinciding with Random House's successful defense against plagiarism claims. I'd like to thank Dan Brown for his patience and for his tremendous support through this trial. Renewed interest in the Grail story has put the Da Vinci Code back on the bestseller lists, shifting 20,000 copies a week. While the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, which is also from the Random House stable, has seen a 100% increase in sales some 24 years after publication. It prompted the judge to refer to speculation that the whole trial was a giant publicity stunt. Conspiracy theory, anyone? For um, all of us, and most people we knew, it was a running joke. Um, in fact, early on, it was suggested by somebody on their side, um, jokingly, um, take out an injunction and both books will profit. But uh, realistically, no, uh, there was no such conspiracy. It's perfect. It's got fantastic timing at the moment. The court case has absolutely brought it into perfect prominence, which is seamlessly moving into the paperback. I'm not claiming that any of these things are deliberate. I'm just claiming that the secret of this strange holy grail continues. Much more worrying is that uh, I'm told that Dan Brown's next book is about the Freemasons, and you cannot write about the Freemasons without writing about the Knights Templar. I think it's all going to start again. And another author who stirred things up tomorrow night, over a year after his death, we examine the cultural legacy of V.S. Naipaul, the trouble with Naipaul, here on BBC Four at 10.